Today we're going to learn about cloning. The first aim is describe how cloning is achieved through plant cuttings and embryo transplants. Then explain the processes of reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning, also looking at some of the ethical issues around that, and then evaluate the pros and cons of reproductive cloning. Around the time I was sitting my GCSEs, a certain sheep made the news. You may be familiar with the sheep, her name was Dolly, and she was the first cloned mammal, or artificially cloned mammal. She was made through the process of reproductive cloning. And this news was very controversial. It filled certain people with wonder and others with dread. An unexpected effect of cloning Dolly was us learning a lot more about ageing. Dolly actually only lived for six years. That's half the length of a normal sheep's life. She was also put down because she had lung disease and arthritis, two sort of diseases you expect to find in older mammals. She was cloned from the mammary gland cells or breast tissue cells of another sheep. And it's for this reason that scientists chose to name her Dolly, after the country singer Dolly Parton, who famously has an ample-sized chest. That's about as sophisticated as humour gets in the biology world. OK, so first up we're going to clone plants, and we can do this by using cuttings. Now if you look at a plant closely, you'll find certain regions where you get this bank of what we call unspecialised cells. These cells can also be called undifferentiated because they are not different. So all these cells are identical and they are jobless. They do not have a specific function, but their advantage is they can develop into any sort of cell in the plant. So where we find this bank of unspecialized cells, we call these regions meristems. And you can find them in a number of places, for example, the tip of the shoot, but also wherever a leaf stems off the central stalk, you can see here. And also if we go down, we can see here and here as well. It's because plants have these bank of undifferentiated cells, or these meristem regions, that they can continually grow back organs throughout their life. So if you cut off a leaf, a leaf will grow back. Some animals also have a bank of unspecialised cells throughout their whole life. For example, lizards. I'm sure you know if a lizard's tail drops off, they regenerate a new tail. The same can't be said for humans, but we'll look at that later. So if we want to clone a plant through a cutting, we have to cut a region where the meristem exists. So I'm going to cut this leaf here, and you can see when I do this, you can still see some of those unspecialized cells at the base of the leaf. Remember, these unspecialized or undifferentiated cells can become any other structure of the plant. So if I take that leaf and put it into, let's say, a soil container with moist soil and nutrients for growth, that meristem region will can develop into roots, for example, and it won't be long before we have a complete clone of the plant. Because remember, those cells and their nuclei contain the genetic information from the original plant. Identical genes will make an identical plant. So to recap, you cut a region where the meristem is found, then you put that section into a medium such as moist soil in which plants can grow. Or we can use plant tissue culture techniques. These techniques involve putting plant cells into a suitable medium, a growth medium with hormones for growth, such as auxins which allow for rapid growth of plants. So you take an undifferentiated plant cell from a meristem region, and when given a suitable growth medium, those cells will rapidly divide to produce cloned cells. And, and then those cells will develop into a plant. This technique is very efficient, very convenient, because little space is needed, as you can see. It's very quick, and you can grow plants all year round. And because you've chosen those cells from a plant which has desirable features, all the clones will have those desirable features too. But cloning plants is fairly simple. What if we want to clone something more complex, like a mammal? Animal clones can be made using embryo transplants. The first step is to select your animals with desirable features, a male and a female version. So take your prize bull and prize cow. You collect a sample of their sperm and eggs and you allow them to fertilize artificially. This will create a fertilized egg cell, which will then divide rapidly to form an embryo. Now, in the early stages of an embryo, all cells are undifferentiated. They do not have a specific job. We also call these types of cells stem cells. Next, we allow the embryo to split several times. So we basically have clones of the embryo, and these embryo can develop into identical organisms. The only thing we need to do now is implant those embryos into surrogate cows. Surrogates are basically the cows that will carry the developing young. 
They are surrogates because they aren't officially their own offspring, but rather have been artificially implanted into their uterus. So a few months later, you're going to get several offspring which contain the best features of these cows. Technically speaking, they are not clones of their parents because they contain a mix of genes, but cloning has been used because we clone the embryos. So what we'll end up with is ideal offspring, not technically clones of the parents. And that is how cloning is achieved through plant cuttings, tissue culture and embryo transplants in animals. Now we're going to look at reproductive cloning, which is a technique used to clone entire animals. So this can be used to create the perfect farm animal, or we can even produce cloned animals to harvest their organs for organ transplants. So let's say we want to clone Dolly. Well, we'll start off with choosing the sheep with desirable features. And personally, I desire intelligence in my animals, so I'm quite impressed by this sheep using the stapler. But we will also require an adult female sheep to provide us with an unfertilized egg cell. So the first step is take a body cell or somatic cell, same thing, from a, the desired sheep. And that's because the nucleus of a body cell is diploid. It contains all the sets of chromosomes you'd expect and therefore all the genes that instruct the body how to make that specific sheep. We will also need to take an unfertilized egg cell from any female sheep. We will then need to enucleate the uh, body cell. That means remove the nucleus. But we want to keep that nucleus because it contains all that vital information instructing the body how to make that sheep. We enucleate the other cell as well, but this time we discard the nucleus because we don't need that nucleus. It's only half complete anyway because it's an egg cell nucleus. But remember, an egg cell's job is to divide and create an entire whole organism. So now we insert the nucleus from the desired sheep into the egg cell. So now this egg cell contains a nucleus which is diploid, which contains all the genetic information needed to create that sheep again. Diploid means it has two sets of chromosomes as opposed to one set of chromosome which you find in gametes such as sperm and egg. Then we need to stimulate cell division and we do this by administering a small electric shock. Once this happens, the cell will divide to form an embryo. Now what we do is implant the embryo into a surrogate sheep and then, six months later, the cloned sheep emerges. So just to recap, take the body cell from a desired sheep and take the egg cell from any female sheep. Take the nucleus from the desired sheep and transfer it to the egg cell or enucleated egg cell. Then give the egg cell an electric shock and stimulate division so it becomes an embryo. Then implant that embryo into a surrogate sheep and six months later you have your cloned sheep. So now we'll look at therapeutic cloning. This isn't the reproduction of an entire organism, but rather parts of an organism. So we can clone cells so that they become organs or certain types of tissues to replace damaged ones in human bodies. But before we understand therapeutic cloning or the process, we must understand the idea of stem cells. So let's say an egg has just been fertilized. This will be called the one cell stage where you have a diploid zygote that will very soon divide to become a two cell stage embryo, which will then divide to become a four cell stage embryo and then an eight cell stage embryo. The eight cell stage is really, really important. This is the last time the cells that make a human body will be truly undifferentiated. You can see at the next division, the 16 cell stage, cell differentiation has occurred. So suddenly these cells now become specific. They have specific jobs. So we may have a muscle cell here or a nerve cell here, for example. We cannot use these cells for therapeutic cloning. The whole point is we have to get stem cells, which can become any other type of cell. So these cells are called stem cells, and they can become, given the right conditions, any other type of cell, heart cells, kidney cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, for example. When we become adults, we only have adult stem cells. These can only differentiate into specific cells, not any type of cell. So, for example, our bone marrow can differentiate into red blood cells and white blood cells, but not muscle cells, not heart cells, and so on. I mean, this is obviously very important. I don't want to trivialize it. For example, if you cut yourself, you'll notice you heal. Where do these new cells come from? Well, they come from your adult stem cells. So how does therapeutic cloning work? Well, the first thing is you extract a stem cell from an early embryo. So I'll take this one. 
You then grow it in a culture medium. That's basically a medium which contains the right nutrients and right hormones to basically develop a certain way. So depending on the conditions, the cells will become specific, specialized cells. So let's say we've given the conditions that help the cells develop into heart muscle cells or cardiac muscle cells. We can then replace damaged tissue in a patient's heart. So you can see how therapeutic cloning is very useful in saving lives. However, there are always ethics involved. For example, some people will say you'll be saving existing lives using therapeutic cloning, but others may say, but at the cost of a potential life. Obviously, embryos can develop into newborns, and some people find that difficult to deal with. However, people who are pro-therapeutic cloning will also counter-argue saying that these embryos come from IVF clinics and most of these get discarded or thrown away, they're never used. The choice as always is yours to make. And that is how we explain the processes of reproductive cloning and therapeutic cloning. Now let's evaluate reproductive cloning. The cons are as follows. Firstly, you get a reduced gene pool. If you're producing lots of cloned animals which are identical genetically speaking, this will reduce variation. For example, if a disease affected one of those animals, it will wipe out all of those animals. Also, like Dolly, the sheep, uh, many clones have shorter life expectancies. This is because the cells used to clone the animal aren't actually new. They are old cells. You see, cells can only divide a certain amount of times before they expire. The number of divisions a cell undergoes before it dies is called the Hayflick limit. In humans, we have a Hayflick limit of around 50 cell divisions. So if you cloned an animal from an old cell, then it won't have much life left in it before the cells expire. There are some remarkable organisms that basically bypass this whole Hayflick limit. For example, there's a jellyfish which can actually live forever. It's immortal. It cannot die. Every time it starts getting old, it reverts back to an adolescent phase. But also other cells which don't have a Hayflick limit include cancerous tumours. That's why they keep them dividing. Anyway, other um, cons include the process often fails. It's a very high-risk process. Some of the clones have genetic defects. And also, it's been known in certain clones that they develop weaker immune systems, so they're more susceptible to disease. On the plus side, however, we can use cloned animals for organ transplants. We currently clone pigs and use their organs for organ transplants in humans because there's such a shortage of donors. Reproductive cloning will also better our understanding of embryonic development, uh, that's the developing embryo, and age-related disorders. And last but certainly not least, it is a way we can preserve endangered species. So here are the main arguments against and for, and this could again serve as a six-mark question at the end of an exam paper. As usual, just pick three from each side and just make sure you can say something about it. And that is how you evaluate the pros and cons of reproductive cloning.